Hello, my name is Tony. Across 110th Street is a neglected masterpiece. When it was released in 1972, the majority of professional critics and reviewers hated it. I mean, really hated it. The New York Times labelled it unfair to blacks, vicious towards whites, and insulting to anyone who believes race relations might consist of something better than improvised genocide. Variety pronounced it not for the squeamish, a virtual bloodbath set in squalid Harlem locations and other unappealing ghetto areas with no relief from depression and oppression, and bemoaned the lack of any glamorous or romantic type character. The Los Angeles Times decreed its grisliness as undeniably true to life, but felt the manner and depiction to be deplorable. What the actual fuck? I mean, way to miss the point. What they were expecting to see is anyone's guess. A live-action Norman Rockwell painting? A remake of The Wizard of Oz? A screen full of endless sunbeams, rainbows, and frolicking unicorns nuzzling the sweet tits of bathing water nymphs? A romantic epic? Little Women? What the fuck? A modicum of homework on the title alone might sort of given them something of a hint, you think? In New York, 110th Street was the traditional dividing line between Harlem and Central Park that functioned as an informal boundary of race and class. Harlem in the early 70s was a low-employment, high-crime district with a monumentally dismal lack of opportunity for the populace. The landscape was dominated by burned-out, deteriorating or abandoned buildings. The predominantly black community was stricken with social deprivation deprivation, poverty, mental health problems, drugs and prostitution which were adversely consolidated by an estimated 60% of Harlem's economic activity being dependent on gambling, numbers rackets controlled by organised crime. I'm not sure how this could be realistically represented on screen by romanticism and glamour or why any critic worth their salt would lament their absence given the subject matter. The aim of the film was to deliver a raw and genuine picture of gang warfare and graphically bloody street violence. One notable voice of reason amongst reviewers of the time was black Chicago journalist Lou Palmer, who in 1973 wrote that Across 110th Street was a more thoughtful and better acted film compared to many black exploitation movies of the time, and that it deserved to be carefully studied for its images and messages. I'm only guessing, but I'd wager that the critics who trashed the film were mostly middle-class white men with an intellectual superiority complex. It must have offended their refined sensibilities for not being glib, comfortable, easy viewing. Arguably discriminatory, then, criticising a film for being what it aims to be, like expressing dislike of a house brick for being a house brick, rather than focusing on whether it functions appropriately as a house brick, whether it's a good or bad house brick, a house brick to your personal taste. Which is fine, if you don't like house bricks at all for some reason, and can justify that dislike objectively. Otherwise, it's beginning to sound a lot like, I don't know, the basis of racism or something. So I won't be doing that. I'll stick with considering whether it's any good or not. Across 110th Street is a neo-noir crime thriller with black exploitation overtones. It tries seriously hard to be as realistic and grounded as possible, evidenced by a remarkable 95% of it being shot in over 60 interior and exterior locations in Harlem, where the story is set. To further enhance the realism, the film was the first to use the Arriflex 35BL camera, which was lightweight, flexible, perfectly shoulder balanced for handheld shooting, ideal for major sound sequences in confined quarters, on rooftops and in cramped awkward conditions. It put the viewer right up close with the action, a revolutionary technological approach, one that worked impressively well under the guidance of cinematographer Jack Priestley. The street level visuals have a wonderfully grainy, unrefined quality that is environmentally simpatico. Director Barry Shear worked extensively in US TV in the 50s, 60s and 70s. He made a handful of movies for the big screen. Wild in the Streets in 1968, The Todd Killings 1971, Across 110th Street 1972 and The Deadly Trackers in 1973. He returned to hack TV work following The Deadly Trackers, most likely because his excursions into mainstream cinema didn't yield the critical or financial returns he hoped for. It's something of a shame, as Across 110th 10th Street was his biggest box office hit, and showcased his talent and competence in the director's chair. It's the best thing he ever did, and deserves to be recognised as such. He certainly had some passion for the project, and the vision and drive to make the film he wanted to make in the way he wanted to make it. 
In Harlem, there is an uneasy partnership between black crime boss Doc Johnson, Richard Ward, and the white Italian mob, represented by an implacably ruthless Nick DiSalvio, Anthony Franciosa. Three black hoods, Jim Harris, Paul Benjamin, Joe Logart, Ed Bernard, and Henry Jackson, Antonio Fargas, in an act of desperation more than anything else, disguise themselves as New York cops and heist a mafia drop for a suitcase full of $300,000. It turns to shit when one of the mobsters goes for his heater and Harris unloads his machine gun, shredding both Johnson and DeSalvio's men. In their escape, they killed two NYPD cops into the bargain. To call the outcome disastrous is something of an understatement. Statement. Fucking cataclysmic. With seven dead, the three men now have the mafia, the black mob, and the fuzz after their hides. From the police end, Lieutenant Pope Yafet Koto is put in charge of the investigation over and above veteran Italian-American Captain Matelli, Anthony Quinn, who isn't best pleased. Pope is a progressive young black officer, whereas Matelli is a bullying, suspect-beating, and corrupt dinosaur, taking kickbacks from Doc Johnson. So there's the inevitable personality, method of approach, and culture clash. The Mafia and Johnson's men set out to identify and locate the thieves. DiSalvio's mission is not only to retrieve the stolen loot, but to torture and mutilate the three as an example and lesson to others. This task is made easier by Jackson's stupidity. Whilst Logart returns to his job in a dry cleaners, and Harris lies low with his prostitute wife in the tenement slum where he works as a janitor, Jackson openly parties with hookers and splashes the cash. He's soon located by Johnson's man Chevy, Gilbert Lewis, and DiSalvio moves in for a very messy and gruesome kill. Pope and Matelli find themselves thrown together in a race against time and opposing forces to locate the remaining two men before they inevitably run out of rope. Across 110th Street is one seriously good house brick. The script is by playwright and screenwriter Luther Davis. He adapted it from the novel Across 110th, which was written by Wally Ferris. Ferris was a New York-based TV news cameraman. It was his first, last, and only book. The screenplay fizzes and crackles along, filled with racial tension, anxiety-provoking chases, and a kinetic series of explicitly violent encounters. It doesn't pull any punches. Discrimination, racial stereotyping and bigotry are consistent themes throughout. On several occasions, members of the black community have a problem accepting that a black cop is running the investigation. A black haulage contractor refuses to tow the suspect's abandoned car to the precinct lot unless he gets written authorization from someone in charge. Even when Pope tells him he is in charge, he won't buy it. Often, characters defer to Matelli, bypassing Pope as if he isn't even there, resulting in Matelli having to verbally correct them or nod in Pope's direction. That's how deeply ingrained the class divide is between white and black people in this place and time. But this is also a time when the notion of black power was on the rise, and it's filtered into the criminal fraternity. Doc Johnson increasingly perceives less reason to affiliate with and be servile to mafia overlords when the black crime organisations could have Harlem all to themselves, run it themselves, reap the reward rewards for themselves. Naturally, the mob is concerned, but inexorably the tide is turning, and ultimately it won't be held back forever. The police are on a double-headed loser. The populace is suspicious, distrusting, see nothing, hear nothing, say nothing. Matelli's modus in response is to intimidate, threaten, and beat the truth out of them. But even this isn't working like it used to. Neither can they expect any help from the organised crime gangs as they have their own agenda. The film is rich with examples of social injustice for people who are terminally marginalised by society and losing all hope. Its commentary is potent and direct and meaningful, something the film critics of the time seem to have conveniently missed, or chose to ignore. The characters are believably drawn and tremendously well acted. Lou Palmer was right on the money. Originally, Anthony Quinn, who was executive producer, wanted John Wayne, Kirk Douglas, or Burt Lancaster for the role of Matelli. They all turned it down. So he stepped in, and it was the right thing to do. He hits the right notes as a thuggish, broken cop nearing the end of his time. A complex character, aggressive, bullying, racist, and corrupt, yet somehow clinging to lingering in tattered vestiges of tarnished honour and humanity. He burns his bridges with Doc Johnson when he threatens him and demands the apprehension, torture and death of the two surviving heisters to be put off limits. Johnson cuts him loose and instead tries to buy Pope, which doesn't go well. He and Pope visit Jackson's common-law wife, Marlene Warfield, to inform her of his death. She's living in squalor with her two young kids in a cramped tenement slum. Matelli gives her a roll of banknotes, saying they were found on Jackson, so now belong to her something he certainly didn't have to do.
Originally, Quinn fancied Sidney Poitier for the role of Pope. Urban legend has it that the residents of Harlem were unhappy with this choice, believing Poitier to be the white man's black man. Too Hollywood, not urban enough. I don't know how true this is, but going with Yafet Koto was again the right choice. Koto was a New Yorker who broke into professional acting age 19, playing Shakespeare's Othello. He radiates screen presence and brooding confidence as Pope, who sees himself as a police officer first and a black man second. When suspects think they can gain purchase with him because of the colour of his skin, addressing him as brother, he's quick to dispel their illusions. Two powerful performances in the lead roles. Some class it as a buddy movie, but Matelli and Pope are not really buddies. Just two men allied by outrageous fortune and making the best of it. The supporting cast does some impeccable work. Tony Francioza is nervous and menacing as Nick DiSalvio, the son-in-law of a mafia don, given the responsibility of making examples out of the transgressors. A wired sweating twitchy sadist, very much into violent torture and prone to explosive rages. Gravel voice Richard Ward's Doc Johnson is a standout, as is Gilbert Lewis as his main henchman, the superfly heavy hitter Chevy. The more minor characters are the ones who elicit the most sympathy. Paul Benjamin as Harris and his screen wife, played by Norma Donaldson, and Ed Bernard as Logart. They are people lost and trapped in a world of crushing poverty and limited choices, laid low by circumstances beyond their control, adrift, hopeless and desperate. Yeah, so they made their big score. All it's going to buy them in the end is violent death and pauper's graves. No way I can explore across 110th Street and not mention the score. The soundtrack, I mean, not the mob robbery, I've already done that. Composed by veteran jazzman J.J. Johnson with songs by Bobby Womack. Womack and Johnson wrote the main theme song across 110th Street, which was a well-deserved chart hit stateside. Womack contributed four additional songs and Johnson did the rest. One of the best 70s movie soundtracks. A definite triumph. Well worth a listen. So then, it's not a glamorous, romantic, feel-good movie. But seriously, it was never intended to be that. When I first saw it, I was both enthralled and stimulated by it. The place where I lived was spiralling into post-industrial deprivation. There was a lot of unemployment, and only the local moneylender was rolling in dough. But as a kid, you see things differently. I saw my environment as a huge fucking playground of fields, trees, mountains, a municipal swimming pool, a snooker hall, and the cinema. With the ever-present thought of when I grow up, I'll move away. But as a kid, there was nowhere else I wanted to be. The Harlem in Across 110th Street struck me thus. This film is fucking great, but I wouldn't want to fucking live there and be one of those people. That's just plain wrong, man. Oh, it goes without saying, I shouldn't have been watching it anyway, as it had an X rating from the BBFC, and I was 13 or 14 at the time. But as an argument against censorship, it taught me valid lessons that stayed with me, because it went for realism, rawness, honesty, and wasn't glib, comfortable, easy viewing, but challenging and provocative. Sure, there's no happy ending, and nearly everyone winds up dead. Another criticism levelled by the New York Times. But then life is a bit like that, I find. And across 110th Street has no intention of patronising anyone's ass with the promise of fake rainbows and sunshine and unicorns nuzzling the sweet tits. Yeah, okay, I've done that bit. You might think I've got something against happy endings or lightweight entertainment or absolute fantasy, but I don't. I gravitate towards pure escapism as much as the next deluded half-wit. I'm no better. It's just across 110th Street isn't that sort of film, and to criticise it for not being that isn't, to me, valid critique. In today's culturally sensitive and much more socially aware society, the language used is an automatic trigger for offence. The N-word is prolifically employed, derogatory racial slurs abound, and that alone might put some right off their soya milk decaf latte and gluten-free alfalfa and prune muffin. So don't watch. The violence and torture, beatings, burnings, machine gunnings might cause some to gag on their vegan and soya bean mustard drizzled hot dog in a wheat-free hemp flour bun. So don't watch. If you strongly feel seeing a film like this will result in an uncontrollable urge to form a mob, march on a university, and pull down a statue of a long-dead white guy whose mother once employed a black cleaner and throw it in a nearby duck pond, or superglue your face to the cat size of a local motorway with your ass in the air as a gigantic articulated lorry bears down on you, then please do watch. These are the sort of things I like to see on the evening news, so don't be put off. 
For me, across 110th Street is a superb example of a black exploitation inspired neo noir police procedural organized crime movie, complete with a masterful score, groundbreaking cinematography, authentic performances by a skilled and committed cast, and a fast paced and thrilling narrative. It's a bloody good house brick, motherfuckers. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and attention. Means more than I can say, so I won't say any more about it. Like, don't, comment, subscribe, whatever makes you happy. More stuff soon, if that's what you want. More stuff soon, if that's what you don't want. Ain't no stopping me now. What's that? I'm banned from YouTube? Shit!